Hey, what is going on all you bus nuts, geeks, and enthusiasts out there? Welcome to another episode of Motor Coach World. My name is James. Before hybrid and electric engines became popular in the automotive world, the two primary types of engines powering all the cars, trucks, and buses out on the road were either gasoline or diesel. Diesel engines are primarily used to power heavier vehicles, such as semi-trucks and most types of buses. Although there are certain makes and models of pickup trucks and cars that are offered with diesel engines as well. Honestly, I don't think there is a coach bus in North America today that runs on a gasoline engine. If I'm wrong on that, uh, definitely correct me down in the comment box below. I would definitely like to know. Chances are if you own a motor coach here in North America, your coach bus will either have a Detroit, Cummins, Caterpillar, or Volvo engine. Again, as mentioned before, all of which are diesel powered. The diesel engine was invented in 1897 by Rudolf Diesel, a German inventor and mechanical engineer. The steam engine being the most popular mode of propulsion at the time for boats, trains, and automobiles, and the gasoline engine being invented in 1885, which was still being considered as a relatively new invention at the time. Rudolf Diesel recognized that 90% of the energy available in the fuel is wasted in a steam engine, and the gasoline engine at the time was simply far too unreliable. Rudolf wanted to invent an engine that was more robust and fuel efficient and could generate more torque. And so he did. Rudolf fired up the first diesel engine in 1897 for the public to marvel. This engine is now on display at the German Technical Museum in Munich. Rudolf Diesel obtained patents for his designs in Germany as well as other countries, including the United States. Until this very day, the diesel engine creates more energy and can drive a vehicle further per gallon of fuel compared to that of a gasoline engine. Diesel engines also generate more power or torque per unit of fuel, which is why it's used more commonly to power heavier, larger vehicles that need to pull more weight. Another benefit of the diesel engine in comparison to that of a gasoline engine was that diesel fuel has a flash point of approximately 175 degrees Fahrenheit. And for those of you who are watching from outside the US, that's 79.4 degrees Celsius. This means that diesel fuel has to be heated up to around 175 degrees in order for it to ignite. In comparison to that of gasoline, which has a flash point of negative 45 degrees Fahrenheit, which is negative 42.8 degrees Celsius. This meant that even in Arctic temperatures, a spark can cause gasoline to catch fire and explode. Diesel fuel was simply much safer to store and transport than gasoline. With that said, the diesel engine did not prove very popular to personal cars and sedans in the US because diesel engines were more expensive to manufacture. They required more maintenance to operate and they tend to be noisier. In cold weather, diesel engine require more time to warm up and overall would just be more of a hassle for the common driver. By the 1950s, the diesel engine had over 60 years of refinement and improvement, making them very dependable and efficient sources of power and propulsion for the transportation industry. In the 1970s, as the world started to work towards reducing pollution, the Environmental Protection Agency in the U.S. started implementing newer and stricter emission standards. This meant that engineers had to go back to the drawing board and redesign the way engines worked. A technology that had been refined and perfected over 60 years to be more reliable now had to be tweaked and changed again in order for less toxins and pollutants to come out of them. The old saying, if it's not broken, don't fix it, came into mind for many truck operators and engine mechanics during this time of change. It's kind of like when you perfected a recipe and got every little detail down so that your dish came out tasting perfect over years of making it, and then someone comes and tells you that you have to make the same dish, but you can't use a stove to make it anymore. The world simply developed a taste for a greener and cleaner environment, and the recipe of the gas and diesel engine had to change in order to accommodate. Throughout the next two decades, newer and more efficient engines were being produced off the assembly lines. Engineers and designers had to ride the fine line of making these newer engines burn cleaner to meet EPA guidelines while maintaining the reliability and power output to satisfy their customers. Unfortunately, on the diesel side of things, as more technology was being added to the design of the already proven diesel engines, they were becoming less and less dependable. The rush of research and development and lack of thorough testing caused many of the newer components that were supposed to help with pollution reduction to fail, resulting in millions of dollars in road failures and repairs. 
In the late 2000s, semi-trucks and coach operators found many newer vehicles in their fleet broken down on the side of the road with their passengers stranded or cargo delivery delayed because of the unproven designs being added to them. One of the solutions to cleaner burning diesel engines was the diesel particulate filter, or DPF for short. Diesel engines create a lot of ash and soot, as well as unburnt components of diesel fuel while in operation. Diesel trucks and buses would dispense a lot of these particulates into the air. That's basically the black smoke you see coming out of semis and buses. DPFs were essentially a device that was placed on the exhaust part of the diesel engine designed to trap all the particulate matter and not allow it to be released into the air. Mainly used on non-road machines like construction machinery and farm equipment during the 1980s, progressively tighter emission standards were being introduced for over-the-road vehicles. By 2009, the DPF was mandatory on all newly built over-the-road diesel vehicles being produced in the U.S. However, any diesel vehicle older than 2009 that did not have a DPF could be grandfathered in and was not required to have a DPF installed. Diesel engines, like any other combustion engine, requires two things for it to function, fuel and air. Without either one, the engine would simply not work. The problem with the diesel particulate filter was that over time, all that soot and ash would start to plug up the filter. And when that happened, it basically stopped airflow from getting into the engine, causing the vehicle to start performing poorly. A truck or bus with a clogged DPF would start to accelerate very sluggishly and would not be able to go faster than 30 or 40 miles an hour, which was a problem on the interstate. This was known as derating. Usually when the filter starts to get clogged with soot and ash, a warning light that truck and bus drivers, as well as diesel technicians today, know all too well would appear. The light warned the operator that the filter was getting clogged, and if an operator ignored it and kept driving, the vehicle would eventually shut down, stranding the driver and passengers on the side of the road. Basically, at this point, the amount of soot and ash on the filter was no longer letting any air through, and you may as well shove a potato in the tailpipe, as that was basically what was happening to the vehicle. Now, the engineers who designed the diesel particulate filter systems were not oblivious to the fact that the filters would constantly be clogging up from the continuous use and operation of the bus. They designed the DPF engines to perform a process called a regen cycle. Basically, the vehicle would use the heat from the exhaust during long duration of travel and cook the filter clean again. During a regen cycle, the vehicle would generate temperatures exceeding 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit to burn the trapped soot and particulate matter from the filter. And once the regen cycle was complete, the filter would be clean and restored to its original operating specifications and functions. On early models of regen DPF engines, there were definitely some shortcomings which caused trucks and coach bus owners a lot of problems. Motor coach models between 2007 and 2010 with the Caterpillar C13 and C15 regen engines ran into many problems where the engine would fail to go into regen cycles. Sometimes coach buses are relegated to local shuttling all day in cities, which means they would spend all day in stop-go traffic at low speeds. This in turn would not allow the exhaust temperature to get high enough to initiate a passive regen cycle. If an operator did this long enough, eventually the dreaded ice cream cone light would pop up. At this point, the driver would have to do one of two things to avoid a tow bill. When a coach bus with a DPF regen engine fails to perform a regen cycle, the driver would have to perform a forced regen. This is where the driver pulls over to a safe area, makes sure there's nothing meltable or flammable near the tailpipe of the bus, such as a car bumper or grass and dry shrubs, and trigger a regen cycle manually. Depending on the make and model of the coach bus, some require a diagnostic laptop to trigger this, and some will simply allow the operator to trigger it by pushing a sequence of buttons on the dash. During this time, the coach cannot be moved and the engine cannot be turned off. The process usually takes from 30 minutes to sometimes over an hour. During the regen cycle, the high engine RPM would generate a lot of heat out of the tailpipe, as well as create an excessive amount of noise. Needless to say, this procedure is not recommended to be done on the side of a public road next to small businesses or residential areas. More preferably, it should be done in some kind of industrial parking lot away from the public. 
The other option was to initiate a passive regen by taking your coach on a joyride onto the interstate. At this point, unless all of your passengers who hired you to do the local shuttling for their event want to take a break and go with you, you would most likely have to take the bus out of service and go drive aimlessly down a freeway for a while until the passive regen cycle is completed. When a bus does not reach interstate speeds all day to trigger a passive regen, the engine was supposed to be able to create an active regen. This is a regen cycle that occurs without having to do anything out of the ordinary. During an active regen, the computer will inject raw fuel into the catalyst to create appropriate regen temperatures in the diesel particulate filter without having to kick the engine RPMs into a high rate for half an hour to an hour. The driver should be able to drive the vehicle normally and be free to stop and go while the active regen cleans the DPF. Drivers will notice a reduction in power during an active region and can sometimes hear a hissing noise from the engine. With that said, Caterpillar C13 and C15 engines were extremely unreliable when it came to performing successful regen cycles, resulting in many bus and truck companies experiencing road failures. The new regen technology that was supposed to keep the air cleaner cost the truck and motor coach industry hundreds of millions of dollars in damages. In 2016, Caterpillar was involved in a class action lawsuit that ended with a $60 million settlement towards current and former owners of vehicles with these engines in them. Today, the bus and truck industry are seeing more refined, robust versions of Regen DPF technology on newer diesel engines. DPF Regen engines still run into problems when it comes to successfully completing Regen cycles when operating in sub-zero temperatures. The exhaust heat generated by a vehicle sometimes just can't get hot enough when it's cold outside, resulting in the need to call for road service or a tow. Advancements are still being made to this technology and the problems of the DPF filter and Regen engines have now become a standard or something to be expected for anyone owning a newer diesel-powered vehicle. In 2010, with the goal of further reducing emissions, specifically reducing nitrogen oxide, diesel engines began to require DEF, or diesel exhaust fluid. All diesel-powered vehicles built after 2010 were designed to stop operating, or derate, when the DEF fluid tank is empty, forcing owners and operators to add DEF fluid to their vehicle. In a tank separate from the fuel tank, the DEF fluid is fed into the engine's exhaust stream to control emissions. The DEF vaporizes into ammonia and carbon dioxide, which then produces three benign tailpipe gases, nitrogen, water vapor, and carbon dioxide. One should note DEF fluid is a mixture of two-thirds water and one-third urea, which is derived from urine. That's right, we add hog piss in the bus to make the air smell a little better. Given the turmoil of the Regen DPF technology in its early days, many coach bus owners lost hundreds of thousands of dollars in repair bills, lost revenue, and tow bills from their experience with the new Regen DPF engines. Bus companies resorted to finding and buying as many 2007 and 2008 model coach buses as they could find, since older model buses were grandfathered in and were not required to have the diesel particulate filters installed aftermarket. All of a sudden, used bus sales lots found such high demand for 2007 and 2008 models, and prices for those particular used buses went up. Even today, there are plenty of operators that swear by and stick to buying pre-2009 models of buses, because they don't have DPF regions in them. It's a scar that will take some time to heal in the coach bus industry, and most likely the truck industry as well. Well folks, I hope you enjoyed today's video. This one was kind of a fun one to make for me as Fury Charter suffered through the whole Caterpillar engine fiasco, resulting in some bad days at the office, and also behind the wheel for me. Passengers just don't care about your explanation regarding the Regen DPF engine and how it's not your fault when they're stuck on the side of the highway on your bus. This in a way is kind of a closure for me from those dark days. As always, please smack that like and subscribe button as you would a derated engine if you enjoyed this video. And don't forget to visit my Patreon page at patreon.com slash motorcoach. Consider being a supporter of my channel and becoming a patron. It takes just two minutes and for a dollar a month, you can say, I got this guy's back. And as always folks, if you're watching this, you are part of the motorcoach world.